All right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries um, both in Nebraska and across the country. Uh, we broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time and the show is officially an hour long. Uh, if you can't join us on Wednesdays, that's fine though. We do record our show every week and it is posted onto our website and I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can see our archives and watch all of our recordings. Usually we use the GoToWebinar online, online uh, meeting sharing system to do Encompass Live shows. Um, today we're using Zoom, a uh, special event we have going this morning um, with our University of Nebraska State Museum. So um, a little different today, but it's working great, I think. Um, on Encompass Live we do have a variety of things that we do here. We do book reviews, interviews, uh, demos, mini training sessions, um, basically anything and everything you can think of that's related to libraries and is any kind of libraries out there. We are at the Nebraska, for those of you not here in, in the state, um, in Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for all libraries. So public, academic, schools, K-12, uh, special muse uh, museums, of course. <laughs> um, we provide services to any of, and all of them. We do sometimes have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come on and do presentations about things that we are doing here at the commission, but we bring guest speakers as well. And that's what we're doing today, obviously. Um, on, um, remotely with us is Annie Mumgard, who is from our University of Nebraska State Museum, Hi, Annie, which is just actually up the street from us here in Lincoln, but <laughs> we're doing a live uh, uh, show here with her at their location to take us on a virtual uh, field trip through some things that they do there at the museum. Um, so uh, good morning, Annie. Glad Good morning. To here. Um, if you do have any questions or comments throughout the session today, you do, guys do all have microphones I can see. Um, if you want to, you can unmute your microphone and ask a question, but there is a Zoom chat in there. If you just click on and open that, you can type in there and Annie can see that as well. And she did mention earlier, if some of you weren't on, that you can also chat amongst yourself there if you want to. Uh, it doesn't have to always be a question to her. You could just be you know, commenting about things, but she does have a separate uh, computer there that she can see anything that you're typing in there as well. So um, I will just hand it over to you, Annie, though, to tell us about what you got going there. At the All museum. right, well, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Krista said, my name is Annie Mumgard. I am an educator here at the University of Nebraska State Museum. Um, I am in our Elephant Hall. I'll show you that in just a minute. I do want to say the reason I have on these big uh, earphones is because we uh, do come live from our galleries, and our gallery today is going to be very busy. So um, hopefully, you if you ever can't hear me, just point to your ears, or Krista can point to her ears, and we can figure it out. But hopefully, you can always hear me. I have the microphone close enough, um, as well as you can put it on the chat line. Um, if you do put it on the chat line, we will find out how talented I am on multitasking, doing visual and reading all at the same time. So we'll go from there. Um, for, well, with most virtual, um, kind of, I only have several online. Has anybody been on a virtual field trip? Raise your hand or wave at me if you've ever been on a virtual field trip. Okay, from the ones I can see, the answer would be no. Oh, there's Tammy. Yes, Tammy has been on several with us. I'm going to expect her to helpfully uh, pitch in on how she could, uh, how it, it can best be used within a library. Because um, I believe, Tammy, we came to you this summer with the ROC program, correct? And Tammy also joined us in Ash Falls. So um, we have an expert librarian here who's been on virtual field trips. So we'll hope to hear from her a little bit. Um, so I will just start with, on a virtual field trip, the first thing I always do is give context of where I am. And I am here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and on the campus here in Lincoln. If anybody knows the Huskers, there's our big stadium down the, the, down the street from us. They have the distinct privilege to be one block from us. And um, we are the Museum of Natural History, which means that we have everything in it from the rocks and animals that we, um, rocks and animals that we walk on, that used to live here, to the animals that live here now. We're also a research um, institution, we're a Smithsonian Research Institution, which means that we have, what we have in our museum is about one one thousandth, one one hundredth, depends who you ask, about what we actually have in our, um, in our whole collection. 
Um, so we started doing virtual, we have been doing um, informal education, such as gallery programs, um, for over 30 some years. We have a, a touch and feel kind of position, place down in the museum, like many museums. But um, we noticed probably about five years ago that the yellow school buses just were not coming to our museum as often as they used to. And so um, we were looking into doing the virtual field trip programs. And so we got a very nice grant about four years ago to get us all set up to do it. So we've been doing virtual field trips for about four years. Now, we originally started, geared them towards um, our classrooms, a classroom teacher. But in the last year, it's always been my intent that these would also be fantastic and could definitely work within a library system. They can also work within an adult um, education system or a, an adult uh, senior center. Um, because our programs, not only ours, but there's a whole bunch of us who provide virtual field trips, um, are a way for you to reach out and bring the world to you that you don't even have to leave your library or your, your institution, and you can bring the world on in. And that is kind of our goal with our virtual field trips. So um, I'm going to show you just a quick little video about um, kind of how that works for us. Part of being a Big Ten university, part of the university is we get a few little perks. And one of them is they thought we were doing such a great job, they did a little commercial about us. So here is, and this kind of shows for you what a virtual field trip can be. Like I said, this is classroom oriented, but we can talk libraries. The reality is today, kids are not taking field trips as often. Our state is over 400 miles across. It can take a lot of time, money, and resources to get here. So what we're doing is knocking down our walls to share what we have here at the State's Museum. Our virtual field trips can bring students from all across the state of Nebraska here to Lincoln to their Natural History Museum. Hello everyone! How are you guys doing? Good. We are live in the gallery and it is not a green screen. We are actually in the galleries so they actually are walking through the halls just as they would if they were actually here. A lot of these kids do not have the opportunity to travel north to go to the UNL State Museum. So if we can bring that into the classroom, it's given them an opportunity they would not normally have. Thank you. So just to recap that, when you think about what is a virtual field trip, one thing I really want to make very clear, it's a two-way interactive digital extension of your classroom, your library, your media center, wherever. Um, it's very, we are very much, whoops, standards-based. Um, we're actually very object-based too, and because we are a museum, we believe strongly in sending along um, the, the, we have many kits. Most of our programs have a lot of kits that we send to you, and you can have a hands-on aspect. Um, the virtual field trips themselves are also, like I said, we've been doing in, um, informal education for over 30 years, and we are based on the inquiry-based kind of learning and teaching. And that means um, not just standing and telling, but having them touch and feel and think through, ask questions, questioning back and forth. And our virtual field trips are very much built on that as well. Um, so, just got a second here, and then get a different. Um, when you think about doing a virtual field trip for your library, one thing we'd like you to think about is, well, what kind of programs can you do? I had to get the right. Here, what do, no, excuse me, what do you need to connect? Well, you need to, do, to connect with what you have right now. And in your libraries, it's the same thing, or your media centers. Now, I'm going to keep saying libraries. I know many are media centers. I know many might be you work with libraries, or you work with, um, you work with schools because of, of, of your work. And it's the same just about wherever you go. Um, I also want to just add in right now, we keep talking about Nebraska, but the biggest thing is, is that we can go anywhere because the first thing you need is an internet. And as you are all from everywhere, I noticed last time we had Wisconsin and Washington, um, um, the same would be doing a virtual field trip with this. As long as you have an internet, you do need about um, um, 12 up, 12 down, what they call megabytes is the best way of doing it, of connecting. Um, but we do a lot of testing, and so we have been known to, now Tammy, you can tell me, and Genoa, I'm not quite sure. You have a fairly low bandwidth, but we connected with your school, is that correct? Right, it is connected with the school. Through the so school, you, yes. Right. 
And I know in Nebraska, one thing that we're really working on is upping the bandwidth for all libraries in Nebraska. And that is a big initiative. And one of the reasons would be is so that you could bring virtual field trips to your library. Because as I said, it is a way of bringing the world into your library. So what else do you need to connect? You have the internet, then you need a laptop or a computer. It's best if you have a webcam because it's two-way interactive. We can see you guys, you can see us, but we also want to see everyone in your, in your building, in your room. And also good to have a microphone. There are these Logitech cameras you can get, which are fairly cheap, $100 or so, that have both of those, so it makes it pretty easy to connect. And then the Zoom app. The reason we do the Zoom app is because um, we have found that it's one of the easiest ways to connect. Um, it's a free app that you can download and that um, we connect that way. It makes it nice and simple for us, and it has um, a lot of other features in it like this as well. Um, so we have all that. You're connected. So what exactly would we do, and how would we do it with you? Um, this summer, we knew that your summer program across the country was Libraries Rock. And um, we also knew that that was kind of looking at music when we kept looking at all the pages. And we're like, well, we don't do music, but we do do a lot of rocks. And um, so we did create a program for this summer about library, uh, about rocks. And we called that Steady as a Rock. And um, with Steady as a Rock, we made this, it was pretty much made for about a, um, we made it so we could go kind of pre-K through six. It was a very general audience. Um, and, we have soon discovered, the nice thing about this is that we then um, were able to take that and now use it for third or fifth graders here. Um, we, we learned a lot from doing that pilot this summer. And that one thing is that we know that your audience can go from a, a six month old to your grandmother sitting there in your summer program, watching your summer program. And um, we did do an interactive with Play-Doh with that and we found a way, we kind of were able to be very flexible and kind of help their, because we can see you, it's like we're in your room. We work with you, who works with your audience and making things work. Um, Tammy, you wanna tell a little bit about how that worked for you? I'm sorry to put you on spot. <laughs> No, it's great. And what was exciting is my library board president and her husband, who are both retired teachers, attended the Steady as a Rock program and both of them said, oh my gosh, that was fabulous, so worth every penny. So that's a okay. good testimony. Very, yes, thank you very much. Very interactive. All the kids had their own Play-Doh. We were advised to have that. And so they were able to use that to manipulate as Annie discussed the different things about the different types of rocks. Uh, they were, they had pre pinned printed cards about the different kinds of rocks so they got to go into their own little groups. So the kids were very engaged throughout the whole presentation. So great job, Annie. Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, our goal is to do that, that we don't want you just sitting and looking at us and listening. Um, um, I always have a joke that adults would rather sit there and look and listen to us, um, but kids are much more like, what are you gonna do to make me, to entertain me? Um, we're not here so much to entertain, but we do use um, a lot of to interact and engage with your students. And we're gonna do a little bit of that in just a minute here. We're gonna have to take a look around. I'm gonna show you how, um, if you brought your students here and we would look at some of our elephants here in Elephant Hall, which I promised you I would show you and I have not shown you yet. So here, um, uh, I'll go to that in just a second. We do have a variety of other programs. We have about six programs, and um, one of them is called, that I think would be fabulous for, for libraries, is called our Science Chats. And this is where it's a 15 minute chat with a scientist um, that you can talk about um, when do they decide they wanted to become, you can talk about their science. Um, we have had them talk about when they knew they wanted to become a scientist, um, what they had to do to become a scientist, and like things that they had to learn when they were younger to become a scientist. So we have, these three are, 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 are rock stars. Um, they've talked about um, Jith there, he's learning how, he's figuring out how to make um, biodiesel fuel from algae, so he actually shows kids how they do plant DNA. Um, Sean, the, Shane there, He's a fantastic um, paleontologist. He, we actually talked to some kids from Florida and he connected it to, he had been to Florida just recently on a dig, so he was able to connect it to their lives. And Maria there is doing work and she's very young, getting her PhD. She's working with birds and um, kids have loved talking with her because one thing she talks about is she couldn't be a scientist, she would be a writer. 
So she kind of really does this lovely career. They all three have done this lovely career base. Jeff talks about how he didn't like science until about ninth grade. So um, it's a kind of a great way. Now, how I could see science chats working well with light and within a library is if you are um, wanting to have them jump off and write something, or if you're reading a book about something and you're like would like to see a career based aspect to it, this would be a great way of doing it. Another program we have for our general audience would be great for you all would be called our Tusker Power. This is a 30 minute program which here in our elephant hall. I'm going to give you a taste of that in just a minute. Just kind of helps, gives you a taste of paleontology, a taste of how these huge fossils were found and how we know what we know with them. I talked about Steady as a Rock. And another one is called Animals in the Hall. And this is for pre-K through second grade. This has a kit that we send to you and you actually help the kids make dioramas. We're downstairs, we look at our dioramas of animals in our uh, Nebraska Hall of Wildlife Animals. Again, we have done this not just for Nebraska, but we've done this for Florida, we've done this for Canada, we've done this for New York, and we can make it very um, appropriate towards your audience because animals are animals. We happen to have animals that um, are native to Nebraska because we are Nebraska's science museum, but um, we talk about habitat, we talk about um, adaptation, and we have kids do a lot of interactive with that. Um, that we have them think about being a zoologist, and this just kind of shows one of the interactives is that one thing we have them do is they have to listen and figure out what the animal is. So I'm going to have you listen. Anybody have an idea of what animal that might be? They're very loud. Is it a wolf? Wolf? Good guess, good guess. Or coyote. <laughs> it's a coyote. And what I would say is that we don't have wolves in Nebraska. We used to have wolves a very long time ago. They went extinct. We no longer have wolves in Nebraska. So it's kind of making you think about place and time and so forth. Um, so that's just one of them. We also do a little activity with kids about using wolf, uh, wolf, sorry, no, I'm saying it, coyote <laughs> ears and not, and our ears and the difference between how, um, he is a predator looking for his prey and how he uses and is adapted to do that well. Um, I'm sure you're all wondering this. Well, this is all lovely. I would love to do it, but what does it cost? And so these are our costs. Just for real quickly, you can also find this on our website. Um, for a 30-minute program, we're $80. For a 45-minute program, we're $95. Now, um, this is actually where you can find a lot more information about us on all of our programs. And I'm sure Krista um, can also send this forward when she uh, puts the stuff out, uh, puts information out. Now this is about us. And of course we would love to see you in our museum. But I also want to just put a pitch out there. There are lots and lots of folks, hundred, there's over 150 providers that I know of that are doing virtual field trips. So when I say you can open your library to the world, I truly mean it. And there's this group called the Center for Interactive Learning and Collaboration. CILC for short, CILC.org would be where you would find them. And you can put a keyword in there, like something you are looking at wanting to do, and it will give you all the folks and the kind of programs that they're doing. Now, there's a lot of programs that are free. NASA has some great free programs. I know that this summer your program is about space. It would be fantastic to search NASA to see what kind of programs they can give you. Um, there's another group, if you put in space, um, I can't remember their name offhand. They're the Jesuit College in Kentucky or something like that. They do this amazing um, program that is about your kids are like in a module and then they kind of work with them as if they're real scientists. Uh, astronauts going up in space. Um, I've heard really, really great things about them. So this is a great resource for you if you're thinking virtual sounds like something I might really want to look into. Um, another resource, and this is because again we're in Nebraska, if those in Nebraska, another place to look is nviz.esucc.org. This is an org, um, put together by all of our distance learning folks out in Nebraska and it has a lot of um, the institutions in Nebraska that do virtual as well as other programs. So that is a lot of information. Before I hop off and show you our elephants, are there any questions? I see something on the chat line. Everyone's, oh, uh, what, somebody guessed it. Any questions? If you have any questions, unmute your microphone, ask the um, questions, or type into the chat, whichever you, you prefer, anything you want to ask now. Mm -hmm. 
I think Tammy did answer the question. She knew the coyote. coyote. <laughs> yeah, very good. Um, I know that uh, what, one, pro, one suggestion that was made to us um, from uh, a media center was that this would be a great, um, actually good for adults that come mm -hmm. to your libraries because um, like a daytime program, sure. because um, we can cover a variety of things. Like I said, it looks like we're very kid oriented, but we'll do Tusker Power. That's not kid oriented, that's for a general audience. Um, our science chats could definitely be for adults as well. Um, if you go to CILC, you will find a ton of stuff that are fantastic. There's like the Cincinnati um, Museum of Art has a really solid program and they do a lot of program looking at their art. Um, the Smithsonian even has a bit of a program. They do it a little bit differently, so forth. But. Well, if there are no questions, and what I'm gonna do is give you just a little taste of what it's like to take our program called Tester Power. And um, I have to revamp myself just a little bit, so hold on for just 30 seconds here. I have to get rid of one PowerPoint and go to another. And more importantly, I have to kind of get my brain to go, okay, here we go. This is when somebody's supposed to be singing, like do, 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 do. <laughs> And let me get here. Here we go. <clears throat> Sorry, I meant to have this up, and here we go. I did have it up, and then we, um, I talked to like five people in between, and that was not a good idea. Well, I'll just share quick that when you first started the Ash Falls program, mm -hmm. it was kind of exciting that our director's meeting, we actually did a virtual field trip as one of their pilots. Mm -hmm. So we were the first ones to see the pilot of the Ash Falls, and then we got to all the directors got to give our insights. Well, we would like to see more of this, or this was fantastic. Got to do some productive criticism. So that was a great opportunity, Annie. So you guys were the guinea pigs for them. Yes. <laughs> they were, I think, the very first guinea pigs. And one of the things was we can't hear you very well. And that's because we had not quite figured out our microphones at that point in time. Mm -hmm. um, I did not point that out, but we do have a virtual field trip to Asheville, which is our sister museum. Asheville is... Um, they don't like it when we say they're remote, but you do have to put effort to drive there. Um, they are out in um, part of Nebraska where um, it's not that remote. It just takes a while to get there. And in long story short, um, it is fossils that are in C2. They're actually left in the ground, and, the fossil, and they're about 12 million, 12 million years old. It all comes from an ancient volcano. But the really cool thing about that uh, virtual field trip is that our educator actually takes the camera into the fossil bed. So you get a closer look at the fossils than if you were even to go to the ash falls themselves to visit. They are only open till November, till, Christ till Thanksgiving time. We have to put the fossils to bed after that because um, it gets the roof is not exactly leak proof. So we have to cover up the fossils to, um, to um, keep them safe. But then they open up in about March and then they would be available all next summer. So um, that would be another interesting good trip. You will find them, I think we have a link to them on our website, but you can also go to Asheville Fossil Beds, and that's another great place. Okay, so I'm going to try to change my brain here. We're going to go to Tusker Power. Now, if you're visiting me for Tusker Power, I would explain to you who I am. I would explain to you where I am. And then I would ask you the question of, I would tell you that I am here in the land of elephants. Now, when I drove to work today, I didn't see any elephants. Did you see any elephants, Tammy, as you were looking out your window this morning? No elephants? Well, that's very odd because actually Nebraska is known as the land of elephants. And that is because our ancient proboscideans lived in this state. I am in the museum and I am in our gallery. Let me get to the right button here. That I'm going to show you really quick. I'm called in, I'm in what we call Elephant Hall. Elephant Hall was created. Uh, when we built the museum, it was went, created as a way, now my camera's going to be a little weird here, it was uh, meant to be a parade of elephants. Let me, hold on here, my camera's coming into focus, as you can see we have a whole bunch of crazy kids. So we're meant to be a parade of elephants, and that would be, like you can see all around the walls here, we have all of our fossils, and going down here, and here I am, hello, and down and all this way. 
And we go from our ancient elephants um, and even all the way to our more modern day elephants. Now we don't have modern day elephants here. Well, we do have modern day just to show as an example. So here in Elephant Hall, um, we have all of our elephants because Nebraska is known as the land of mammals. But now because we have um, 35 million years of fossils, because Nebraska did not get swept, the, the Ice Age did not sweep across Nebraska, kind of stopped right at the edge of our border. So the, the, the animals that were living here before the Ice Age, which came and went, um, have, we still find many of their fossils here in Nebraska. So the first question is, what's a fossil? Anybody want to tell me, give a guess on what a fossil is? Oh, I know you all have microphones. You can just type it in, too. What's a fossil? Anybody have an idea? Old bones, someone says. Old, old <laughs> bones, fantastic. Now, when I ask you to tell me the first kind of fossil you think of, I want you to shout it out. Everybody open your microphones. Open your mics. I'm going to ask you, when I say fossil, what do you think of? Fossil. Yeah, dinosaurs. 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 Everybody thinks of dinosaurs, right? And of course, dinosaurs are fossils because that's the only way we know about the history of dinosaurs is the fossils that they left. But, what, but being, we want to give a good definition of fossil. And fossils are the remains of plants and animals and other organisms that lived a long time ago. So um, we think of bones, but we also have many fossils of plants. It's very important for us to find fossils of plants because that also helps us to understand what the creatures would not only be eating, but how much oxygen there might have been in the air. So um, we, we talk about being here with paleontologists. The university has been um, going out and digging up fossils for over 125 years. Um, we um, have been going just about everywhere. I love that picture shows a little bit about how they had to um, adapt their own clothing. Look at the nails on those boots. Um, and then preparing the fossils to bring them back here into the museum. Um, now, the first fossil, like I said, I'm kind of giving you a condensed so my brain's going to. The first fossil that, um, so we have a lot of elephants in here. And the question is, well, how did we even start working on elephants? So about 1857, um, there was a gentleman by the name of Lieutenant G.K. Warren, and he was a soldier, and a topographer, and an engineer. And he was sent out, this is uh, to come out to the place called the Nebraska, um, the Nebraska Territories, and he was sent out here to make a map. And he was sent out to make the map for, it was the Kansas-Nebraska Territories, he was sent out to make a map for the railroad because they wanted to go across the country. So he came out about 1857, and he was kind of scouting around in upper, upper Nebraska, which at that point was land that belonged to the Sioux. And he found the first, let's just say, recorded fossil. And because we're pretty sure um, the fossils were being used by the first peoples before we did, but he has the first recorded fossil. And I'm going to go over there, and I'm going to show you what it was that he found. And he found, I'm coming, I'm coming. He found a fossil that looked very much like this. Anybody have any idea who this, what this is and who it might have belonged to? Is that a tooth? It is a tooth. And who do you think it might have belonged to? Uh, mammoth? <laughs> or Very good. We're going to give Krista an A by the end of this, okay, everybody? She's going to have to get a round of applause for being a first piece. That is, this is a tooth. He found a tooth very much like this one. Um, and it is the first recorded tooth. Now, when I show this to kids, they pretty much always think it looks like an Adidas shoe print, which I would have to agree with them. It does, yes. Um, <laughs> does it not? Um, this is a mammoth tooth. This actually is the tooth that came from our friend Archie. Archie is the largest mounted mammoth in the world. Um, he is about 14 feet tall, and uh, he is about 30,000 years old. He was found in the um, 1920s, and he was found by a relative of the dinosaur. Hmm. Anybody have an idea of who a relative of the dinosaur might be? 
Uh, birds. Bird. Birds, very much so. <laughs> uh, Archie himself was found by chickens, needless to say. And he was found by the chicken in, in Mr. Carragher's farm, farmland. The chickens kept digging around in the same area. Mr. Carragher was like, why are they digging there? He went over and looked, and he found the very front, the, the tusks, Archie's tusks. Now, he was kind of an entrepreneurial kind of farmer, and he pulled out those tusks, and he went around the state fairs, and he was showing, he was charging people to come on in to look at his, his tusks. Um, and then here at the museum, we finally got a hold of him and said, do you think we could uh, get the rest of this elephant out of there and use it for the museum? I do not know if they um, uh, paid him any money or not, but um, we did get Archie. When he was first exhibited, this is how he first went up, and those are Archie's legs. So as you can see how tall he is, we could walk underneath his legs. He then came over here when we built the museum, and we mounted him, and he's been mounted here in the museum since the 1920s. Now, um, there are a few things we know about Archie. Now, I told you that he was found, not he was not found, the first, the first um, mammoth tooth, recorded mammoth tooth was found not by a paleontologist, but was found by someone who was a, a more of an engineer, a topographer, and a soldier. But the thing about paleontology is that they have to take, and most scientists, you use what you know and you ask questions to apply it towards what you don't know to find some answers. So as a paleontologist, what you would do is you would look at, and I told you we had some modern day animals, you would look at, here in the museum, I'm move my camera just a little bit, Next to Archie, we have modern day elephants. These are some Indian elephants, and a male, female, and a baby. They're not related, but they kind of look good together. And what you would do as a paleontologist is you would know uh, comparative an anatomy. You would know the structure of an elephant, and then you could compare that towards Archie. Now here's the cool thing about Archie. He is made of seven different fossil finds. Um, when we found Archie, we found his tusks, his, his skull and his femur, his uh, shoulder bone there and some of his femurs. So we knew how big he was. Um, but, we both, but it's hard to find a full mammoth fossil. So he's what we call a composite fossil. And this is in many museums. They use a variety of finds and they put it together so you could see what one whole creature would look like. And so hence we have Archie. Now like I said, this is his tooth. He is, only has one of his teeth. This is one of his teeth. Being a proboscidean, a member of the proboscidean family, another thing we know about elephants, proboscideans are creatures with long noses, is that they would have four of these in his mouth. I'm just going to show you real quick his mouth so you can be like, what? How does that work? I'll just show you how close we can also get to some of our creatures. I moved my camera here. So that is Archie and his... Now his tusks are about six to eight feet long. And just because I want to show off, I can actually even get closer to Archie and we can see exactly where those teeth would go in, right there. So that is about, that's about at least 14 feet up, 15 feet up, because I could not make it there. Um, now another thing, if we were actually doing this with your kids, that we would have them do, and I just, I'm not gonna do it right now, is we would have them, well, I'll do it with you, we would have them do an interactive. So at this point, we talk about teeth and how we know about teeth. So Archie's tooth kind of looks like an Adidas tennis shoe. The reality is it's nice and flat. And so when you have a nice flat tooth, we know there's a few things we know about how a tooth like that is used. I want you to go ahead and put your hands together like this. Go ahead, I can see you. There we go. And we're gonna pretend we're Archie's tooth. Archie's tooth is, he is not, a, he would be a grinder. He would go up and down and he would grind like that. Now if you were grinding, I was, I'm just saying I don't think I put this on my, my thing. If you were grinding, would you be grinding? Keep grinding here, I'm gonna show you something real quick. If you were grinding, would you be grinding grass, bushes, conifers, or fruit? I need somebody to have to tell me. What do you think you would be grinding? Yes, all of the above. <laughs> all of the above. Well, let's think about it. Do you have to grind your fruit or can you just mash it? <clears throat> yeah, well, yeah, I guess it doesn't need to be ground. No, no. Yeah, you just kind of mash it. Soft fruit. enough to what just. What kind of animal, 
what animal alive today do we know that kind of grinds their food? Kind of like chews, pulls and chews and pulls and chews. We got a lot of them here in Nebraska. Oh, like a cow. Even a cow. What does a cow eat? Grass, hay. Mostly grass. Let's see if you're right. Let's give her a drum roll, everybody. Go ahead. Give me some drum rolls. There we go. And grass. You're absolutely correct. And so for Archie, he would, one thing we know about him, he would be eating grass. And the other thing we know about him is that because of the fossils we find with Archie, that he would be living in a cool and dry place because all the other animals that were alive with him could live in a cool and dry place. This is what we think Archie would look like. Um, Archie is 20, this guy is about 30,000 years old. He lived to be about 10,000. The mammoths were in Nebraska until about 10,000 years ago. People showed up around 11, 12,000 years ago in this area. And so there would have been humans walking around with him, and this is how big they would have been next to our friend Archie. And in Nebraska, these are the places in which we have found a variety of fossils. Now, the question is, this is Nebraska. How in heaven's name did these guys get here? And elephants came across about 14 million years ago, they came across on the Bering Strait. So that is just Archie. This guy, who's 14 feet tall, would have weighed as much as seven cars, um, was found by chickens, um, and has, has tusks that go like this. He's kind of like a ballerina when he walks around. But there are a whole lot of other ancient elephants around here. So this guy was found by chickens. I'm going to go over here, and we're going to show you some other elephants that were found because of chicken pox. Here we go. I'm going to turn my light. There we go. These guys are called gompotheres, sometimes called four tuskers. You might be able to see why they might be four tuskers. Let me get my camera just right so you can see them. And let me get my lights up here. So gompotheres, they came over about 14 million years ago on that Bering Strait. They were around this area till about three million years ago. This guy right here, as I said, Archie was found of chickens. This guy was found because of chicken pox. In 1913, um, there was a big outbreak of chicken pox. Now, some say it was measles. Some say chicken pox. Nobody wrote it down. I'm going with chicken pox because that goes well with my Archie fan, the fan there. Um, the, the, Mr. A.C. Whitford, the principal, was a, a hobby paleontologist. Everybody else got sick. They had the day off. He shut down the school, and he went out, and he went looking for fossils. And this is what he found. He went to this place called Devil's Gulch here in Nebraska. That is what it looked like. Now, most of Nebraska is pretty flat and um, maybe rolling hills. But Devil's Gulch up in northern Nebraska looks very much like this, has these really sandy areas. This also would be very close to the place that our soldier in 1857 found his first known fossil as well. And he, he was down here in Devil's Gulch. He found something very interesting. He came back. He told the museum. The museum sent out a team. And this is us pulling up some of the femurs of this guy. They're probably about 200 pounds there in that wagon, pulling them up the Devil's Gulch. Um, and this is a variety of the other fossils they found. They're all in what we call, um, they're all in their casts because to save a fossil, you know, as I like to tell kids, if you would you throw your grandma over your shoulder, or would you be afraid you would break her? Most of them say, of course, you're going to break your grandma. I'm like, well, these guys are way older than your grandma, and so we have to put them in these casts so that we can safely bring them here. Now, here's the very cool thing about this guy. I told you about Archie. We could kind of figure out um, he lived on a dry gr grassland. It was dry and cool. Well, with our gompotheres, by and large, every single time we have found a gompotheer in Nebraska, we have found with him alligator teeth, garfish scales, these little mouse deer, um, fossils from the mouse deer, petrified wood, as well as the tusks. Hmm. Now, you're a very smart group. I'm going to ask you, what kind of habitat would have alligator teeth, fish, wood, small deer, and elephants walking, running around in it? Um, swamp? It would have to be a little swampy, right? Would it ever get cold? I don't know about you. Not with you alligators. They would not live. They wouldn't survive. Very good. Not with alligators. They would not survive. So when we find fo the small fossils that we find with our large fossils really help us to understand habitat. Um, we're going to take you, I'm going to take you to this guy real close here. Mr. Gompathy here and show you his jaw just a little bit so you can get a little bit better idea of why they got their name of Fort Tusker. Um, with kids, I would also at this point say 
tell me something that's different than Archie. Um, three things that you see that you notice are different, as well as something that's different about him than modern day elephants. We'd have a little bit going back and forth. Um, because we can't, everybody's unmuted here, we're just gonna give forward. One thing they all mentioned is his jaw, and that's a good thing to look at because his jaw is really unique. The reason Mr. Gomp is here, he has, he's called a four tusker because when he was originally found, this is a tusk right here. That's his, his two tusks. But then they also found this jaw line. This is his mandible, this jaw right here. And it goes all the way down to here. And some of the original thought was like, wow, did he have four tusks or is that his jaw? And um, this is his jaw. Now, this is his tooth. See here? Quite different from Archie's tooth, as you can see. Much smaller than Archie's tooth. Again, he's a proboscidean, which he's from the elephant family. How many of these hold up fingers? How many of these would he have in his mouth? There we go, you're right. He would have four of them in his mouth. Still pretty big. Um, they also are a very different shape. That's because Mr. Gompathir here, if he, uh, he's a masher. If we'd have kids put their hands together, he's mashing like this. I always say if he was a superhero, he would be like um, Hulk. He'd be smashing his food, and he'd be eating um, mostly fruits and vegetables. When we find all these other small animals with him, we know we can kind of put all that together. And we can kind of figure out his habitat. And this is our theory of his habitat is that he lived in a forested grassland. Very warm, never got cold, never froze, and rather wet. Not exactly a swamp, but definitely not the grassland that we have today. Now, Mr. Gompathir behind me, he is over 11 million years old. This is what we think he would look like. He would never have lived here with people. They did not, were not around, but if people were standing close to him, this is um, what they would look like. Now, Mr. Gompathir is found mostly up in northern Nebraska and um, out west. Now, what geological type on my map do you see? Where do we mostly find our gompathiers? What kind of natural element are we finding them? Does that question make sense? Mm -hmm. Along the rivers? Yeah, near water. In near water, absolutely, because these guys are so old. They are down deep in um, our, in our sediment. And um, we have to have, we find them mostly by the rivers. The rivers have channeled down and gotten us deep enough so that we're able to find our gompathiers. Um, depending on your age range of kid and or audience, we can then go in to talk about the different sediment um, formations and what kind of different fossils we find in them because of the way the geology works. Um, so that in a nutshell, in like really quick 20 minutes, is without a lot of the interactive is our tusker power. So that kind of shows you the range. Um, with adults, we can have more questions and answers. Um, we did this one time with an adult uh, senior center, and um, boy, did I get grilled on modern day elephants. So I learned to <laughs> figure out more about modern day elephants um, and how we knew what we knew to apply it to ancient elephants. And with kids, like I said, it depends on your audience. You can kind of tell us, we can do a range of do you want to know more about paleontology? Do you want to know more about fossils? Do you want to do some geology within there? And so forth. So it can be really customized to whatever is going on in their curriculum at the time. It can vary. We nice. can be very customized. Yeah. No, we can. And I know most providers can. We're, we're really here to support. Um, I didn't talk about this before, but virtuals, I really see, can do three things. They can engage your audience in a topic matter because they can take you outside of your own world and take you someplace to engage you in whatever it is you want to be talking about. They can um, really involve you in that because they can extend your classroom learning because, or your museum learning because, again, they take you outside of your classroom or your library and give you more information. Um, and the last one is that they can really um, kind of really give you that hands-on without really getting there. If we send you a kit, that gives you some of that hands-on and that inquiry-based learning can happen as well. Um, so um, it's really good. It can really fulfill a lot of, of inquiry-based um, needs and learning by doing a virtual. If you have a kit, even without a kit, like you saw, we can do interactives. So it can give you a feel for the space. I'm just going to throw this out there right now. We haven't quite done it, but for um, 
This summer, we understand that the summer reading theme is space, space? for next year. Yeah, mm -hmm. next, next summer. Year. Space. So, what we are considering, and you can put it in the chat line if you think it would be a great idea, we're considering taking. We do have some meteorites from space mm. here in our museum, and we are thinking about taking um, our rocks program and kind of expanding a little bit and looking at the difference between the meteorites and what they're created for it and what our rocks here on Earth are created with. So like, if you were an alien looking at our rocks, how would you understand them, much mm -hmm. as we try to understand meteorites from outer space? So I think that's what we're going to try to develop for libraries for this coming summer for the reading program. Um, we'll really do it if you email me and tell me to. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. I think that's awesome coming from that direction of it and just showing that there's, you, you think of the State Museum as just history, but you can just, you can just mix it up and just have it be anything, really, if you just, you know, think outside the box. <laughs> so, yeah, well, that's what we'd love to have you do. What do you think, well, Tammy? Would that be something, or anybody else on the line? What do you guys think? Oh, somebody's chat says, Keith says, absolutely, go for it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. All right. Okay, well, we, we probably will then. We were also told last year that um, we had to have it done by November, and we started to laugh. <laughs> but it, yeah, it, some of the library, depending on the libraries, they're, they're starting any time from, like, now through, like, next spring getting things planned. So definitely, if you're going to be doing something that they could, you know, build into their um, budget or the, their planning, uh, letting them know as soon as possible that you've got something in the works, that's the thing too. I mean, if you just wanted to say, hey, this is coming, you know, we'll have it for you by the time you want to do this next summer, you know, let us know and we'll make sure we get, get it ready for you. That sounds good. And I'll just want to add to that, remind you about that CILC site. If this sounds like a great mm -hmm. idea, it's, an, it's a nice way to, if your budget is getting smaller, but it's a great way of bringing speakers to, uh, into your museum. Check out CILC, and you can find out all kinds of different providers who can do different kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I have a young friend here who's, who's waving at me saying, this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> so there's actually, I was just writing myself a note here too, Annie. Um, here at the Library Commission, Sally Snyder, you may know her. She's our Children's and Youth Services yep. Coordinator. And she yep. is actually starting, I think next month, doing her summer reading um, workshops across the state here for our libraries. So I may let her know or have her just contact you about including in her talks the fact that you guys are developing something that they should, you know, because this is, this is like a half day or all day workshop about here's some things you can do for next year's um, uh, program. Right. Right. And she can get you um, at least to let them know that this is something being developed. So keep an eye on it or reach out to you to let you know, like you said right now, that you, how many of them want to have it be a, a thing. Um, also, if you're interested, one thing we have done for several of the different um, um, library depart districts um, is on when they had their own workshops mm -hmm. that they, we connected with them for like 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. We just did that, that quick little what's a virtual and this is how easy it is to connect and these are a few things we can do for you. We wouldn't give them the full spiel like we just did here um, with the elephants and everything, but gives them a nice view and it also kind of takes away that um, a little bit of that, oh my gosh, it's technical, it must be really hard, I, I can't possibly do that and hopefully we kind of show them that it's not really, it's very quite easy to connect. Um, I know Eric helped me big time and I know Tammy's done it, so it's very easy to connect and it kind of gives a really good hands-on show and tell of um, how you can use it as a resource. So if anybody, any place would like us to um, do some pro that kind of professional development for you, please contact us. We're really help. We're really would love to help you do that. We have a 15-minute presentation we can do for you that kind of gives the full picture. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you for inviting us. And of my course. apologies again for last week. Oh, I hope it was okay. worth your wait. We're all back today, so it all works out. Yeah. There you <laughs> um, go. I know I had, um, see, the reason I had invited Annie to come on the show um, was that we do have here in Nebraska our youth services earlier in the summer that she presented at um, that I didn't get to attend, but I definitely wanted to see some of this. So 
I kind of use sometimes Encompass Live for my own little, I want to see this. <laughs> um, and it was also a couple weeks ago at our library association, Nebraska Library Association, School Librarians Association. And you'd mentioned at the beginning about presenting with, um, that you do this with other organizations. I think there you also, you had the Ashfall, but also um, the OMA, the Henry Dorley Zoo. We connected with Henry Doyle Zoo, um, the agate fossil beds right. out in way western Nebraska, and one. with the Joslin. That's right. The Joslin. And you know, the Joslin would be another great, um, they have an, a piece of art by Jackson Pollock called, I don't know if it's called Space or it's called Space Walk, or it's something very space oriented that would be another, um, uh, and I think they might be free. I'm not 100% sure about that, but the Joslin has a has the ability to also do the virtual. Mm -hmm. um, we oh. are going to be doing a program with, um, I look like I'm not in focus there. We're going to be doing a program with the Omaha Henry Doyle Zoo on November 8th. We're doing it three times during the day. Um, if anybody's interested, it's free. Um, we already have over 2,000 kids signed up to come, but that's okay. We can take some libraries if you would like to open it up to maybe an adult audience. We're going to be talking about um, elephants because we'll be talking about our ancient elephants that came over 14 million years ago, and they walked here, and we're gonna then talk about modern day elephants who were flown here and to Henry Doyle Zoo, and we're gonna talk about you know the similarities and differences, and we end up with conservation. Because mm -hmm. obviously our elephants went extinct, we don't want elephants today to go extinct, so we're kind of ending that. And that's kind of how we're celebrating um, National Distance Learning Week. Um, but if you look on our website, you can find out it's called Elephants in America, Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm going to warn you, we're like, we, we are, this is our first time we've tried this and we are, um, to say we're a little overwhelmed by how many people want to come is a little bit of a, we're, we're having a conversation today. We have an idea of how we're going to do it, but we're like, whoa, 2,000 kids, we better get, we is better this, have this down pat. Yeah. So is this something that is just going to be, there's, is there a max of number of connections you could have to one of these sessions? Do you know, or? We're going to do it through a webinar, and the max on the webinar is, I think, 100. Uh -huh. uh, we, don't, we don't want 100, um, because just like today, I can only see three of you. It's kind of very hard it's to hard do. It's um, get a lot of people in one yeah. of these, yeah. 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 But with that program, we will be using the chat line, so we will be having the classrooms talk to us via the chat line, and we will have someone dedicated to reading that and throwing us questions that are coming in. Yeah, you need um, other people there to help. Yeah. Yeah, this yeah. isn't one person event <laughs> right so for you for a viewer you can set it up so you can see all the other classrooms which is kind of cool because then you can see oh, yeah. in this case it's mostly kids across nebraska just because mm -hmm. we've not put the word out there nationally and mm -hmm. um we're kind of glad we didn't because we're i guess we already got 2000 we're we're super excited but um uh but though that will be that you can see others that are there or you can make it so all you'll see is us and you can do your chat line so um, Tammy it said, would, it would got, Tammy's already registered, she said. Oh, yeah. Oh, someone else? Yeah, very good. And are any of our sessions recorded? Um, we don't record our sessions usually, um, mostly because we want you to um, come and be live with us. The interactive um, part is really um, important, I think, for the, what you guys do, yeah. Right, right. The one, the few times we've done it is if um, somebody missed it and they were planning on doing it and they missed it and they knew they were going to miss it and they let us know. We did do that. We recorded it once and made it available for a week for, I think it was for a teacher who was trying to do six classes and something happened and her sixth class couldn't take it. And so we, we did record it and um, so they could use it. Um, but by and large, we don't record because it's that two-way aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Let's see, do anybody have any other questions here? Swamp. Yeah, anybody have any other questions? Unmute yourself and ask uh, or type into the group chat. Either way works. And I will, I will mention, you, you did mention about the different websites. I, there will be when we do, um, and you know, Diane did ask, do you ever record? We are recording today, but that's a special case because this, this is our weekly webinar that we do here at the Library Commission. And when I do put up the archive for this, um, we'll have the recording, hopefully, fingers crossed. Uh, Annie's doing that at her end and she'll send it to me. But I, um, we also do have in the um, page uh, a link to their website of all the different virtual events um that cilc one that you did i took notes about the other all the other ones that you, the other say things that you mentioned so we'll have some links out to them as well 
um, for you so you can have um, all of that information. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I will just assume that I was brilliant and that's why there were no questions. And you have now made my rest of my day and I appreciate that very much. Yeah, I think well, it's thank you. Um, um, yeah, thank you. I'm gonna um, share my screen now, hopefully, and see if we can get this, uh, let's see, share. You should be seeing my screen here with the page. Yeah, okay. I went to look when you were mentioning, um, yeah, the Elephants in America, here it is on um, the UNL site. Um, and this is on, um, I just went to, this is the link that we actually do have on our page for today's event. I just had already had a hot link here to the virtual, um, and I had to just scroll down a bit. And here's all the other ones. You can see some that include the kits, and this is how you can register for them. And then there's the Elements in America ones, if you are interested in doing that, November 8th. And they're the three times, 10 a.m., 12.30, and 2 p.m. Central Time. Adjust for your own time zone if you're not here in the, Midwest, in the middle of the country. <laughs> okay, thank you. And um, the other one would be just Asheville. Go to the Asheville. I don't know if we have a connect, uh, hot link on ours. We used to. But Asheville is one of our, they also have a virtual that's really pretty cool. But like I said, you have to do it by Thanksgiving or after March. But they would be great for next summer. Mm hmm Absolutely. All right. So, um, yes, that will, I think, if nobody has any other questions, everyone's just saying thanks. Good job. All right. I think you did awesome. I'm so glad I got to have you in. I was very, I, I'm kind of a little upset that I didn't get to see the full session of the <laughs> Tusker Power, but it was very, very cool and interesting. I liked it. I think I um, might have to come by and take a visit at the, to the museum again. Museum again. I haven't been there for a few years. It's always good to take another walk through and see everything. <laughs> Let me know. I'll bring up a tooth for you to touch. <laughs> awesome. All right. So um, that'll wrap it up for today's show. Uh, it will be, as I said, it will be on our website. This is the, sesh, the page for today. But on our main and campus live website, we have our upcoming shows. And right underneath there, there's a link to our archives. This is where all of our recordings go here. Our most recent one's at the top. So when today's is done, it will be listed here. Uh, this is the one that we did most recently. We'll have a link to it. We usually post it up to our Nebraska Library Commission's YouTube account, uh, which hopefully will be working. I heard, so I heard yesterday there's issues with YouTube, but <laughs> generally it works. Uh, so you have a link to that. And I, as I said, we'll have links to any of the other things that um, Annie had mentioned will be here. Anyone who is um, here with us live today or did register for today's show will be sent an email from me letting you know when the archive is ready. It will take some time for them to get it processed, send it to me me to upload it so um by the end of the week i'll say just to play it safe depending on what goes on with it so um that will be for today's show i'll be joining us next week when we will be talking about strategies for identifying fake news something's going on in our world today is the proliferation of fake or as I said, at least dubious we'll be diplomatic about it news and uh judy henning is a professor at university of nebraska at Kearney, will be joining us also remotely uh, to talk about how you can work with students to um, identify these things and get them to do some critical thinking about it. So please do join us for that. Uh, sign up and register for that one and any of our other upcoming shows. I am working on, this looks like we only have a couple of shows coming up. I'm working on confirming some shows for November, so this will be getting filled in, so don't worry about that. Just keep an eye on our page and uh, you'll see what our uh, other shows coming up will be. We are also on Facebook. I've got a Facebook link here, and over here is our Facebook page. We do, I do post here reminders of shows that are coming up. Here's a reminder to log in for today's show. When our archives, our recordings are available, I post on here. I've got a lot of pictures of Archie because that was the most recent one. Here we go. The recording of the previous one. So if you're a big Facebook user, give us a like over there. Uh, we'll only post a couple of times a week um, announcing the current shows, upcoming shows, whenever the recording is ready. So um, if you want to keep up on what we're doing over there, give us a like on Facebook. Other than that, that wraps up for today's show. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you for being here with us, Annie. This was awesome. It was a lot of fun. Um, and we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Thank you so much, Annie. That was great.